Welcome everyone and thank you once again for joining us with another reading with the Reformers. And this is our third one now and I hope that you are enjoying them. And today we're going to be looking at a man by the name of Octavius Winslow. And I just want to really encourage you uh, with this week's message because uh, we're looking at, as I mentioned last couple weeks now, we've been going through a series on looking at the person of Christ. And today, uh, the subject that we're looking at through Octavius Winslow is the love of Christ. And this is, I'm really excited to do this reading because this is a very, very encouraging piece um, from his writings, and I hope that it encourages all of you. And so before we get started with the reading, um, I would just like to ask for all of you to bow with me now as we pray and ask God for his help and for his blessing through this time. So let's just pray together. Heavenly Father, we come to you once again through your Son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for the blessing of this time. Thank you for giving us the, the desire to, to, to be part of this, Lord, to listen um, to these, these men who you have called to preach your word, to instruct your church. Lord, we thank you for the wisdom that you imparted to them to do this task. We thank you for the uh, just the encouragement that, that we have so far, I hope, been part of in all of this. And I pray that today would be another day of encouragement, another time of encouragement as we look at the love of Christ. And Lord, there is so much more than could be said in this short amount of time. But uh, Lord, I'm just so thankful and so appreciative of of this piece and how much of an encouragement it's been to me. And I, I pray that you would use that as an, use this as an encouragement to others as well, Lord. And I thank you for the work you will do in that. And I pray God that those that are watching today that are discouraged and maybe are struggling with, Lord, it could be, we don't know, it could be many, many things, Lord, but you, you know, their, their hearts, you know what they're struggling with. And you know that this time Lord has, has um, been purpose for for your your purposes. So we pray, God, that part of that purpose would be to encourage uh, our brothers and sisters who are struggling, Lord. And I pray that through this time you would you would lift their spirits, you would lift them, uh, Lord, just that they would feel um, encouraged through the understanding, maybe a little more even in this time of of the love of their Savior and that you would strengthen them in that. And we thank you for that, Lord God. I pray for myself that um, that you would just humble my heart before these wonderful truths, Lord. And I pray, God, that uh, that we would not just be hearers of the word, of the truths, but also doers of them, Lord. And I thank you for that. I pray that we would apply what we learn to our lives. And, and we pray that 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 would be for the purpose of honoring you and glorifying you, Lord. So we thank you for that as well. God, I just thank you once again for the time that you've you've given to us for this, this time together. And I pray, Lord, that each one would be encouraged and strengthened and, and guided and corrected, Lord, if that is what is needed. So we thank you, we praise you, and we ask above everything else that you would be glorified, your son would be exalted, in church would be edified. And we thank you also, Holy Spirit, for giving us wisdom and, and discernment and understanding in these truths. So we, we honor and glorify you as well. So we thank you for all these things. Once again, we ask them in our Lord and Savior's name, Jesus Christ. Amen. So as I already mentioned, we're looking at Octavius Winslow's uh, short um short piece on the love of Christ. Now this is just, when I say short, this is just because it's a portion of his larger piece in this particular subject. And as I mentioned in the past, I just wanted to reiterate how uh, how accessible these men are. Um, some of them may be new to you that are watching, but I really encourage you to kind of look up some of, the, some of these authors, some of these men, and, and be encouraged by their writings because there's so much, there's so much value in and the wisdom that God has given them to share with the church. And so I just hope that you would you would avail yourself of that. Now, having said that, I wanted to look at um, just something that that I've encouraged you in the past on, and that is that uh, 
you can, once again, I'm going to talk about Kindle, and this is not to promote Kindle's website necessarily. I just want to show you how accessible and how uh, how economical these these writings are from these men. So again, you can buy on Kindle, and this is a digital copy, so it's a download. But anyways, um, you can get the works of Octavius Winslow, and this includes nine sermons and 36 full-length books. So um, you, you can just tell it's quite a lengthy amount, a large amount. The total length is 5,520 pages, and it even includes a 31-day devotional um, in this package. And so you get all these, all this stuff, for only $8. So once again, it's... Um, it's really economical, and there's so much content in here and so much encouragement. And of course, as all, all these other readings we've looked at so far in what I mentioned that you can get on Kindle, um, the love of Christ that we're looking at today is also available in this series. So with all that said, let's get to uh, why we're here today primarily, and that of course is to, to look at this writing from Octavius Winslow. And... Uh, there's just one other thing that I'd like to reiterate, um, and I know I've said it re repeatedly in the past, but I don't want I want to say it one more time, and that is that uh, we can become quite absorbed, quite wowed, quite enamored, even with with these men as far as their writing and their, their writing style and their ability and their wisdom, and it's um, God has gifted these men, and there's no question about that. But what I want us to really focus on, and I'm going to say this a lot because I, I want us to see this and grasp and, and look at this point really carefully, and that is that this this is not to glorify these men. This is not to um, to promote these men in, the, in a sense that, you know, you should be looking at them because they're, uh, they're such great people. That's not the purpose. The purpose here is to encourage us to see Christ more clearly. And that, that's what I, I hope is happening through these, and that's my desire. And I, I can, not that I knew these men personally, but I can say with uh, the things I've, I've read of theirs and um, other men that I trust in the faith who have commented on these men, that they're really, their goal is, uh, is the purpose of glorifying Christ. And so that's, that's my encouragement to you, is that you would not be wrapped up in what these men can do but wrapped up in who they are writing about and that of course is our lord and savior jesus christ so please be encouraged with that and and with all that said let's get finally to our reading which is octavius winslow and like we've done in the past i'd like to just share a short biography uh, because uh, probably a lot of you may not know who this man is and there's way more information about him that you can get but this is again just short a short biography of Octavius Wenzel and this is what it says it says he was born in 1808 uh, in Pentonville a village near London he was the eighth of 13 children though he grew up in New York he spent most of his life in England Winslow was one of the best known nonconformist ministers of the 19th century in England and held pastorates at Leamington Spa Bath and Brighton he was one of the preachers at the opening of Spurge's Metropolitan Tabernacle. Winslow pastored a Baptist church on War Warwick Road in Leamington Spa, Warwickshire, from 1839 to 1858, and in 1858 became the founder and first minister of Kensington Chapel, Bath. In 1865, the church became a union church, a mixture of Credo-Baptist and Pado-Baptist. This may mark a change in attitude in Winslow, who in 1867 left the Baptist pastorate and was ordained an Anglican deacon and priest in 1870. For his remaining years, he served as a minister of Emmanuel Church, Brighton, and in 1868 he had produced a hymn book for this very congregation. He died in 1878 after a short illness. And again, this is The Love of Christ by Octavius Winslow. There is no love like the love of Christ. The association of contrast will aid us here. Who is love 
is the author of all human affection. Love is the creation of deity, the descendant of heaven, the reflection of God. He whose soul is the most replete with divine love is the most like God. Paralyzed though our humanity is, is by the fall, tainted as it is by the sin, by sin, the human heart is still the home of love in some of its loftiest and purest forms. It is impossible to behold its creations without the profoundest reverence. Who can stand, for instance, in the presence of a mother's love and not be awed by its dignity, won by its power, and melted by its tenderness? But there is a love that equals, a love that excels, a love that surpasses it, the love of Christ. Institute your contrast. Select from among the different relations of life the nearest and dearest. Choose from those relations the deepest, purest, truest love that ever warmed the heart, prompting to generous and noble deeds, to tender and touching expressions, to costly and precious sacrifices. Place it side by side with the divine love that chose you, the love that ransomed you, the love that called you, the love that soothes you, the love whose eyelids never closes whose accents never change, whose warmth never chills, whose hand is never withdrawn, the love of Christ which passes knowledge, Ephesians 3.19. And it is the very opposite of selfishness. The love of Christ stands out in the history of love as the divinest, the holiest, the strongest of all love, unequaled, unparalleled, unsurpassed. Oh, there is no love like Christ's love, Trace its features. First, the love of Christ is a revealing love. It uplifts the veil from the heart of God and shows how the heart loves me. I would have known nothing of the love of my Father in heaven, but for the love of my Savior on earth. In that penitent, believing soul that feels the softest, gentlest pulse of Christ's love throbbing in his chest knows more of the heart of God sees more of the glory of God, and understands more of the character of God, than were earth and sky and sea to collide all their wonders and lay them at his feet. Second, the love of Christ is a condescending love. No other love ever stooped like Christ's love. Go to Bethlehem and behold its lowliness, and as you return, pause a while at Gethsemane and gaze upon its sorrow. Then pursue your way to Calvary and learn in the disgrace in the curse, in the gloom, in the desertion, in the tortures, in the crimson tide of that cross, how low Christ's love has stooped. And still it stoops. It bends to all your circumstances. You can be conscious of the becloudings of no guilt that it will not cancel, of the pressure of no sin that it will not lighten, of the chaff chafings of no cross that it will not heal, of the depths of no sorrow that it will not reach. Of the dreary loneliness of no path, it will not illumine and cheer. Oh, is there a home on earth where the love of Christ most loves to dwell, where you real, will regularly find, yes, always meet it? It is the heart, broken, contrite, and humbled for sin. Thirdly, the love of Christ is a self-sacrificing love. Christ also has loved us and has given himself us for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for his sweet-smelling savor, Ephesians 5, verse 2. What a laborious life, what a suffering death was his, and all was but the outpaying, outpouring of his love. He obeyed every precept of the broken law. He endured every penalty of an exacting justice. The path that conducted him from Bethlehem to Calvary, wound its lonesome way through scenes of humiliation and insult, of trial and impoverishment, the storm growing darker and darker, the thunder waxing louder and louder, and the lightning gleaming brighter and brighter until its central horrors, horrors gathered round the cross and crushed the Son of God. O marvelous love of Christ, what more could you do than you have done? To what lower depth of shame could you stoop? What darker sorrow could you endure? 
Where did another cross ever impale such a victim or illustrate such love? Number four, there is, nor is there any love so forgiving as Christ's love. Forgiveness of injury is an essential element of true affection. We cannot see how love can exist at the same moment and in the same heart with an unbending, unrelenting, unforgiving spirit. Real love is so unique and lofty a passion, so godlike and divine in its nature and properties, we cannot conceive of it but an alliance with every ennobling, elevating, and unworthy sentiment, selfishness, malignity, revenge, uncharitableness, and all evil speaking are passions of a fallen and depraved humanity, so hateful and disregard degrading, it would seem impossible that they should exist for an instant in the same atmosphere with true affection. But a yet a loftier form, a more sublime embodiment of love is presented to us in the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. God cannot love, we speak reverently, and not forgive. Those whom God loves, God pardons, that God regards every individual of the fallen race with a feeling of benevolence is unquestionable, for he makes his son to rise on the evil and on the good, and he sends rain on the just and the unjust, from Matthew 5.45. But those to whom the love of God extends his everlasting, his special, and his redeeming love, the gracious, the full, the eternal forgiveness of all sin, likewise extends. God cannot love a being and give that being over into the hands of a stern, avenging justice. Divine love will never lose the lowest and unworthiest object of its affections. If, my reader, you feel conscious that you love God, Though your affection be but as a smoldering ember, as a glimmering spark, be sure of this. God first loved you, and loving he has pardoned you, and pardoning he will preserve you to his heavenly kingdom, that you may behold his glory and enjoy his presence forever. We, remark, we repeat the remark, there is no love so forgiving as Christ's love. A human love may for an instant hesitate and falter. It may dwell upon the wrong inflicted, the injury done, the wound still bleeding, may in its very muteness speak in tones of inexpressible sadness, of confidence betrayed, of feelings lacerated, of friendships devalued, and the heart may find it difficult to take back the wrongdoer, the offender forgiven, and the offense forgotten is to its embrace. But not so with Jesus. He has cancelled, obliterated, erased every shadow of shade of his people's sins, and they shall come no more into remembrance. Then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me, and I forgive him? Up to seven times? And Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times 7, Matthew 18, 21 to 22. Contrast this love, my reader, the forgiving disciple, the forgiving Savior, and then exclaim, Who is a God like you, pardoning iniquity and passing over the transgression of the remnant of his heritage? He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in mercy, Micah 7, 18. There is no love, too, so gentle, so patient, so enduring as Christ's love. Again and again you have questioned it, wounded it, forsaken it. Again and again you have returned to it with tears, confession, and humiliation, and have found it as unchilled and unchanged as his nature. It has borne with your doubts, has been silent beneath your murmurings, has veiled your infirmities, and has planted itself a thousand times over between you and your unseen and impeccable foe. It has never declined your, with your fickleness, nor frozen with your coldness, nor abraded you for your backslidings. 
but all day long, tracking your wandering, winding way, it has hovered around you with a presence that has encircled you with its divine, all-enshrouding and invincible shield. Truly, truly, there is no love like Christ's love. Well, dear friends, I really hope that that was an encouragement to all of you. And if you're struggling right now with feeling uh, just unsure about God's love and and maybe uh, there's some doubt in your mind, uh, I hope that if you are a believer that that encouraged you to recognize that you are loved and that evidence is clearly presented to you in the person and work of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So I hope and pray that you've been encouraged by this and that you'll remember that Yes, we will fall, we will falter, but as Octavius Winslow has so adequately reminded us here, that if you are loved by your Father, and if you have been forgiven through his Son, then it is an everlasting love and an everlasting forgiveness, and you can take peace and rest in knowing that. So I hope that encourages all of you, and once again, I just, I really hope and pray that that you will see Christ more glorious more wonderful, and more perfect and pure through this time. That is really my hope and my encouragement to all of you. So um, with all that said, let's just close this time in prayer. Oh, Heavenly Father, we thank you so much once again for this time that you've given us. We thank you for the reminder, Lord, that you have loved us with an everlasting love. You have given your Son, and Lord, by that, by knowing that you have condescended down to this world in your Son, and you've given us um, just such a, a remarkable, um, un, unimaginable sense of your humility through what your Son has done for us. Lord, we recognize that you, you will go to the uttermost to forgive your people. Lord, so I thank you for that, and I pray that this time has been an encouragement to those that need encouragement. I, I hope that it's been strengthening to those who are feel weak in their faith. Lord, I pray that it has been assuring for those who are doubting. And Lord, I pray that has even God been convicting for those that doubt your love. And so I thank you for that. God, I pray that you would give us wisdom as we think about the truths we have heard today. I pray that you would give us discernment. I pray that your Holy Spirit would guide and direct us so that we can be more honoring to you as we we think about our our position in your son and think about how wonderful it is to be a child of yours. So God, I pray that you would again encourage us not just to take these truths, not just to learn them and understand them, but to apply them to our lives, Lord. So not only would it be more honoring and pleasing to you, but for those that are around us that see us, that that witness our testimony, God, I pray that this these truths would would flood into our lives and affect those around us so much so that they are curious and ask, uh, why? what is the joy in you? Why are you so at peace with what's going on? Lord, that we could give them an answer, that we could provide them with the hope that we have been given through you. So I thank you for that. I thank you for all you'll do in that, Lord. And I ask once again that in all these things, that you would be glorified, your son would be exalted, and your church would be edified. For your glory alone, we pray and ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.